Okay, I think I might have uh, overdone it a little bit. Um, but we've been talking about the pelvis recently. So, uh, a piece of anatomy that people need to know more about and sometimes come unstuck on is the pelvic floor, also known as the pelvic diaphragm. Let's have a look at the pelvic floor. Bones, bones and ligaments, bones, ligaments and muscles, you can actually see the pelvic floor there. Bones, ligaments, muscles, viscera. And then we've got these two, so we can see the viscera from either side, right? So you guys, what do you guys need to know about the pelvic floor? I mean, this, uh, this piece of anatomy encompasses a huge range of people. Um, what is it? Where is it? Why is it important? And then we can delve into the anatomy. What are the different bits? How is it innovated? What happens when it goes wrong? Things like that, right? Okay, so um, how is everything held inside your abdomen? <laughs> You got the bones of your thorax, you got the bones of your pelvis, but there are no bones here, right? We've got this, we've got muscular walls here. So you have the anterior abdominal wall and the posterior abdominal wall, and they're stretched essentially between the ribs and the bones of the pelvis and the lower limb and stuff like that, right? So it's the it's the muscular abdominal wall that holds the small intestine and the large intestine and all the other stuff in place. And it's the same in the pelvis. What holds everything in place in the pelvis? Because essentially without muscles and stuff, there are lots of big holes. But even if you just think about gravity, you've got everything inside your abdomen, because the diaphragm separates the abdomen from the thorax. But you've got everything inside the abdomen weighing down on the pelvis. You've got all the structures in the pelvis weighing down as well. So you need to have something here, right, holding it all up, stopping it from falling out, as it were. And that's what the pelvic floor is. So you can maybe see why it's called the pelvic diaphragm. Um, diaphragm, pelvic diaphragm, right? So, what's the pelvic floor for? It's for keeping everything in, uh, in its simplest idea. And that's what we see there. But the pelvic floor is an arrangement of muscles and it has a number of things passing through it. So, and that's the other thing is, look at the shape of the pelvic floor, can you see? Right, it's... Right, it's a curved bowl-shaped hammock, which if you think about it is quite strong, so it's suspended from the bones in this space here, and it's forming this curved space, which is really, really strong, and it's holding everything in place. And of course it has to be strong, not just, to, just, not just in the sake of gravity and holding everything in place, but also when you cough, sneeze, or increase your intrathoracic, intra-abdominal pressure for any reason, or when you're lifting heavy things for all sorts of reasons. Um, then the pelvic floor needs to be able to contract to hold everything in place, but also needs to be able to contract to stop anything leaking out, because there are a few things that pass through the pelvic floor. Which leads me on to my other functions of the pelvic floor. This is the female pelvis, so we can see passing through there the rectum, the vagina, and the urethra. Those are weaknesses in the pelvic floor, so there are potential flaws there, which might cause us problems, we'll talk about those in a bit. But also that gives another function for the pelvic floor. If we think about the urethra and the rectum, then the pelvic floor, as those muscles pass around those openings, they can help incontinence, can't they? As in they can help with continence, help incontinence, help stop incontinence. Um, so you can use the muscles of your pelvic floor, and these are somatic muscles, you can contract these. I'm contracting mine right now. So you can contract your pelvic floor muscles to prevent urine passing out through the urethra and to prevent feces from passing from the rectum into the anal canal. And we can have a look a little bit more about how that works, right? So the pelvic floor muscles are also important in holding the pelvic viscera in place, stopping everything from falling out, and in fecal and urinary continence. So this hammock-shaped muscle then is three muscles forming the pelvic floor, also called levator ani, which you might think of as a muscle group. Uh, and the three muscles are pubo rectalis, pubo coccygeus, and ilio coccygeus, or geus. And normally, muscles are sensibly named, and mostly they are here. So 
puborectalis then is a muscle that's passing from the pubis bone here to the rectum. And that's the innermost muscle, that's the most medial muscle. So that muscle is going around um, these structures that are passing through the pelvic floor, passing through levator ani. So that's puborectalis. Now what puborectalis does is it passes from the pubis and it meets itself, or rather meets its opposite on the other side. So these two muscles loop and they form a sling and they form a sling around the rectum where it passes into the anal canal. And when that muscle has tone then, it actually puts a little kink. So instead of the rectum and the anal canal being straight, it pulls it anteriorly, so there's a kink. And that kink then obviously helps close off the rectum from the anal canal, which is really helpful in faecal continence. So you can see how a weak puborectalis would, would stop that kink from forming and it would be much easier for feces to leak from the rectum into the anal canal and so on. So puborectalis is particularly important in faecal continence. So that's puborectalis. The next muscle is pubococcygeus, and that passes again from the pubis bone to the coccyx, coccygeus, right? So here's the coccyx, here's the sacrum, right, back here. And there's also the uh, anococcygeal ligament. So we've got the anus around here, um, and we have other connected tissues, like uh, between the anus and, say, in the female pelvis, the vagina, there's the, the perineal body. And these connected tissue structures are anchoring points for all the muscles and, and what have you in this region, which keeps it all strong. Anyway, so pubococcygeus then passes from the pubis bone to the coccyx and to the anococcygeal ligament around here. So far, so good. Puborectalis and pubococcygeus. Pubococcygeus is quite a big muscle um, and that's that's a big bit, bit of the bulk here and it's very inferior so pubococcygeus probably does a, a lot of the work um, now the next muscle is um, iliococcygeus and uh, iliococcygeus is is a little bit more lateral but iliococcygeus is passing from the ischial spine to the coccyx sorry about that um, so do you remember the ischial spine? All right, so here is the ischial spine here. All right. Um, so it's passing from the ischial spine to the coccyx. Of course, this is the obturator foramen here, and it has obturator externus and obturator internus muscles overlying it, and it has an obturator membrane. And around here as well, there's also an obturator fascia covering this. And while we're talking about the pelvic floor, we should also say there's a pelvic wall, right? Um, but the obturator fascia then, um, iliococcygeus also attaches to that obturator fascia to pass posteriorly to the coccyx. So why does iliococcygeus pass from the ischium to the coccyx? Why isn't it called ischiococcygeus? I don't know, I'm sorry. It, it, it's just one of those things. So that's the levator ani, that's the pelvic floor. We've got puborectalis, pubococcygeus, and iliococcygeus. Tricky, tricky iliococcygeus. Um, but you can see that, there's, as I said, there's a, there's a lot more muscle around here. And we have obturator internus. Um, you never really see them on these models, but obturator internus. And also you've got piriformis. You remember piriformis? Piriformis is this pear-shaped muscle that passes out through the greater sciatic foramen. There's the sciatic nerve there. Big landmark. So, so we have piriformis and obturator internus also forming the pelvic wall, right? So the lateral walls of the pelvis. And we also have, on well, the anterior bit as well, we also have coccygeus. So coccygeus is another muscle. Coccygeus is not considered part of the pelvic floor. It's not considered part of levator ani. But coccygeus is also running from the coccyx and around laterally here, and that's forming part of the, the walls of the pelvis there. Um, so that's the, the muscular shape that you can see here. And it is difficult to tease these muscles apart and work out which is which, both on the models and in dissection. Um, and we've got a number of layers here as well. Now, in terms of innovation, well, we've got the sacral plexus right here. The sacral plexus is lying over most of these muscles and sending short fibers to innovate most of these muscles. And we have the pudendal nerve. Here's the pudendal nerve here, running out and around. Of course, that's trying to get to the external genitalia. And as the pudendal nerve runs around, that's also going to send some fibres to levator ani. So levator ani muscles are innervated um, from a number of sources. Um, 
but it's somatic innervation. You can control the contraction of your levator ani muscles, your pelvic floor, right? Um, so we talked about pubo rectalis and the, and the rectum, but we've also, in both the male and female pelvis, has got the urethra passing through. And you can use your pelvic floor muscles to stop urine, you know, as a, and the part, we, we can see that the external anal sphincter is embedded in there. These muscles as well, as they pass around the vagina in the female pelvis, and they pass around the prostate gland in the male pelvis, they send off slips of muscle fibers around there, so they attach to all of these things. So all of this is very integrated. So the, the opening in the pelvic floor for the urethra and the vagina is the urogenital hiatus, and the opening for the rectum is the rectal hiatus. The pelvic floor can be damaged by surgery, um, but I think the most common way of damaging the pelvic floor is, is through childbirth. So the female pelvic floor is at, at, at much greater risk. So with age and with multiple vaginal deliveries, um, of course, every time um, vaginal birth occurs, the pelvic floor muscles have got to be have got to spread. They're going to be stretched. There's risk to the nerves and what have you around here. Um, and what happens if the pelvic floor muscles lose their tone, get a bit stretched, aren't as strong as they normally are? Um, well, you're gonna develop problems with urinary and fecal continence, possibly, um, maybe leaking urine when, when you cough or sneeze. But also, of course, these muscles are supporting the viscera of the pelvis. So with serious damage to these pelvic floor muscles and weakness and stretching of these pelvic floor muscles, there's an increased risk of prolapse of, of the rectum, of the vagina, of the uterus even, all of those things which might need to be supported surgically. So how do I strengthen my pelvic floor muscles? Well, the, the famous method of the Kegel exercises, right? And um, it's, just like, it's just like any other sort of strength exercises, is um, it's isolating that muscle group and you can contract your pelvic floor muscles on their own. It might take a little bit of practice. And the idea is that you maybe, you know, contract the pelvic floor muscles, hold them contracted for five seconds, rest for five seconds, um, repeat that, say, five times, do that a few times a day, and then slowly build up the load until you're doing 10 reps at a time. Um, and that will strengthen the pelvic floor. If they're really weak, weakened by age and multiple vaginal deliveries and what have you, and the muscles are really stretched, the Kegel exercises might not help much. But um, um, specialists that I've spoken to say that they think that if people were more aware of their pelvic floor muscles and kept their pelvic floor muscles strong, it would cut down on their workload massively and people would be much healthier, as in their pelvises would be much healthier, and they'd be much reduced incidence of pelvic organ prolapse. So consider your pelvic floor muscles. It is worth trying to keep these things strong. All right, I hope that was useful. It's quite good having these benches. The, uh, the technicians have bought some new benches, some nice high ones. It's quite good, this. Although I think it did mean I probably picked <laughs> too many models. <laughs> right, onwards.